Well, hey guys, I wanna welcome you to tonight's open um, session here for you to be able to ask whatever you wanna ask. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and allow you, um, if you have an interest in um, talking, go ahead and raise your hand. Feel free to ask me a question um, so that I can try to answer it. Uh, we can also hop on the um, software if you'd like to take a look at that, but um, how can I help you tonight? What's going on? Uh, how are, how's the process going of using the MyCap software? What kinds of questions do you have? Anything like that, uh, feel free to chime in and let me know how I can help you tonight. Tell you what I can do is um, I'm going to go ahead and allow you all to talk. Uh, you know, let's just try to do it one at a time. Um, so I'm going to give you that, and uh, well, well, we'll go through here and see if anyone has any questions. Um, Bala, do you have any questions for me this evening? Hey, uh, good afternoon, Dan. Um, hey there. How are you? Hi. I'm good. How are you? We're doing great. Okay, okay. So I have a few questions. Um, let me one give a, give me a minute. Uh, so I logged into the tool, okay, and um, there is something called the profile at the right side, right? Um, and then I see account info, personal info, and college pre-approval. Okay. So when I click the personal info. I'm able to uh, enter some details uh, over here. Um, what I notice is after I input the details and click save, it is not saving. Okay. Oh, some that's of the weird. details are not, yeah, some of the details are not saving or it keeps going back to the original value. Say, for example, students top school, I selected some other school. But by default, it is selecting the first one on the list of colleges that I added. That is one flaw. And then, um, and then there is something called the parent, guardian, own a home. If I put, if I put yes and save it, uh, again, it flips back to no. Okay. Oh, that's very uh, strange. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay. So, and again, for your information, I'm not using the free one. I... Uh, I bought the valedictorian one. Okay, so you uh, got the scholar one, which is the upgrade, huh? Yeah, I, I, I got the upgrade. After attending a few um, sessions, I decided to purchase this one. Yeah. So uh, I, was one, I was thinking initially that the free version only has these kind of issues, but the, even the upgraded one also, these informations are not saving. So Okay, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I, I will definitely get you an answer. Um, since I'm the only guy on this session tonight, I can't do it this evening, but I will definitely okay. mm -hmm. reach out to you tomorrow if that would be okay. And I'm sure we can figure out what's going on. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. Yeah, I'm, sure, I'm sorry that you're you. having that trouble because um, yeah, it's really strange. It's not saving the information for you because it absolutely should. But, yeah. um, uh, you know, because uh, the system is designed to do that. It's actually supposed to save it so that you've got a chance to be able to look at those details and things. Right. Um, so I've got your name and everything down here. I will for sure get in touch with you tomorrow so that we mm -hmm. can work through the, that and, and get that fixed for you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay. Did Thank you have you. other, any other questions before, um, before we move on to somebody else? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't want to take the entire session to answer only my questions. I'll, I'll come back in the meantime. You can go and ask some other, you can give chance for others also to ask. Okay. All right. Well, that's very gracious of you. Hang in there and uh, I'll mm -hmm. go ahead and um, mute you for just a minute and then I'll come back to you in a few minutes. Sure. Dad. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Hey there, Joseph. Uh, do you have a question for me this evening? Uh, no, not at this time. Okay. Uh, just here soaking it all in, <clears throat> getting ready for uh, my second daughter to head off. So, oh. she, hey, right, she'll be a senior next year, so we're in the, in the thick of it now. But 
Uh, no, no, things are, we're in good shape here, I think. Thank you. Okay, okay absolutely. Well, thanks for coming to this tonight. I'll, I'll go ahead and mute you here and we'll move on to somebody else. Take care. Hey, Kate, did you have any questions uh, for me this evening that I might be able to try to answer for you? Yeah, I might. I also don't have a kind of question. I I purchased uh, uh, my um, college pro act from Peg. Cool. Oh yeah. Okay. Some time ago, so I I am quite familiar with the tool. The only thing is, I'm wondering, is it um, is my version being updated as well, or is it? what I purchased, I don't know how, do I get any live updates or is it what I purchased a year and a half ago from Peg? Yeah, no, so it's a good question. Actually, the system itself is updated all the time, uh, in particular when it comes to the updates um, associated with the scholarships and things that are in the database. Yes, um, as well as the wondering. colleges. Yeah, yeah, especially like, as you can imagine with the colleges, they are constantly, um, you know, tweaking what it takes to qualify or you know, even sometimes descriptions as far as what's going on there. And so the good news is that that system on a monthly basis is being um, watched and as updates take place, then they make those changes. So you're always gonna have the latest, greatest information there when you're using the software. So uh, let me, so is this exactly the, the link people uh, log in as well now, or do I have, uh, a different link. Well, so let me ask you this question. When you bought that original plan, you said it was like a year and a half ago? Yes, maybe Did... even longer because that oh, okay. was when uh, had her own uh, business, I guess, yeah. Jour journey to college made easy. So uh, okay. no, actually I bought it on, on uh, March 31st last year. Okay, so probably what has happened, Kate, is you, you've now, um, you have the software access for a year. And so you probably need to go ahead and purchase it again, because, you know, again, that, that would have um, already matured on you. Okay. And you can do that by going to the uh, MyCap. Um, it, it, you can just Google MyCap and it'll bring it up for you. Cause it'll say MyCap and it'll have College Aid Pro and then that gives you the ability to go ahead and update that. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other questions, Kate, that you have for me? No questions. This was the, the, the important one I had. Yeah, it's a real important one. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for coming tonight. Hi, Lisa, are you there? Yes, hi, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great, thanks. How can I help you this evening? Um, actually, I'm just here to listen. I have a rising junior, so we're just starting this whole process. Oh, uh, well, good for you. I, I'm glad that you are doing this early and not waiting until it's too late. You know, it's one of the biggest challenges that happens out there is that families sometimes, you know, wait even to the spring of the senior year to finally figure out how they're gonna pay for college. And boy, do they, do they ever end up paying the price, you know? So um, again, I'm yeah. Glad well, that... luckily we have luckily we have a five twenty nine plan, which has you know a decent amount of money in it. So that's that's going to be very helpful. <laughs> Without a doubt, your kids are blessed. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. So good for you and <laughs> yeah, for you guys to have that. And whatever you do, make sure to you know start plugging numbers in and taking a look at colleges so that you guys can really deal with it from an affordability standpoint. I think that's awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for being here tonight. Actually, I, uh, Lisa's question uh, uh, made me think about some question sure, I want to ask you. Yeah. I also have 529, but it's a GET, Washington GET program, GET, okay. Guaranteed Education something. <laughs> I don't remember what T stands for. It's, um, it's a prepaid program. Mm -hmm. And I have twin boys, and and for some I'm not quite sure why, but in the information I have money in two accounts for each of them, but it tells me that I have to report when I fill out FAFSA 
report the, comp the, the whole amount, even though I, I have it kind of split by uh, two, two different students. And, and by the way, that is true. Yeah, whenever you're completing the, the FAFSA, you do indeed have to list the total value for all children that you have in 529 plans, not just for the one child. Okay, so even though I have twins and they will go to school at the same time, it, it it's uh, I guess FAFSA will do ask for whether or not I have another student. It does, yeah. It's not dependent upon the individual student. It's literally dependent upon um, the amount of money that you have in accounts like that in the 529 plan. Now, the good news is that's considered an asset of mom and dad's, yes. not the child's. And so that's a huge deal because, as you know, that saves you money. Um, it's 5.64% versus 20%, which would be for the assets for the children. So, um, but, but you do indeed need to list it for all children. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Tamara, um, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Welcome tonight. Did you have any questions? I see you've got your hand up. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Oh, here we go. I uh, recently purchased the uh, $300 or $200, uh, $300 uh, yeah, the, high, high package. Right, the $299, which is the software plus um, a one hour consult with an yep. expert. Yep. All right, and um, I had previously plugged in some numbers, financials, and um, just over the last few days had plugged in um, schools that we're seriously considering. And, and to, to note for some of the previous callers, um, I don't know if there was you have, that you have to save pretty much as you plug things in, you did searches and you said you wanted to add it to the list. It, um, it, it added, um, pretty easily. So, um, I think I'm similar to the other gentleman that, you know, said he, he purchased an upgraded package. And I will caution other users that haven't purchased any of the upgraded packages that once you add schools, I found out you can't undo those first selections. And I'm sure that's kind of something in the software that, you know, you, you, you then couldn't, you know, switch out schools and pretty much get the power of the program without paying for it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's one of those things where, um, as you can imagine, somebody could just go in there and just keep deleting yep. one school and adding yep. another school. Yeah. So I just, I wanted to say that um, it, it's great software um, in terms of, and I think it, it'll be well worth it. All right, here's my question. Sure. Um, it's first of all, related to the community. Um, I'm still kind of trying to learn and I've been clicking and I'm, and I'm, I'm, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, you're good. Go ahead. Okay. Cause I clicked on the community. I'm logged into my software. I'm, I'm, um, I clicked on community. Do I need to log into the community and create a profile? Now you got me. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, I will I will tell you that I'm I'm clicked in or I mean I'm logged into the software I can see all the schools I can see all my financial when I when I click on community it um, it has my cap connect uh -huh. and then it says add info and create account and then up in the upper right hand corner it says sign in here I'll come I'll, I'll come in and say grace with you guys. Okay. Yeah, I don't. So here's what I'm going to do. I, I would suggest to you that um, um, I, I'm a novice when it comes to the community section. I'm not going to lie to you. So what I can do for you, though, is that I will be happy to check that out and get you an answer. Okay. okay. Yeah, because I, I, I know it's and it's one of those things where maybe they can even send out a little notice to folks as to how you get into the community to be able to access it so that you all are good to go. Okay. Yeah, so that, that's one question. And then yeah. um, on the scholarship search. Yes, yes. Um, 
I have, I noticed under each of the schools when you purchase the upgraded mm -hmm. package, and I, this is a plug to, to purchase, you, you get access to the school specific um, uh, scholarships, but um, I'm in the scholarship, the private scholarship search portion of the program. And there's like eight buttons that you uh, would fill out to, you know, see what scholarships are out there from a private perspective. Mm -hmm. The more specific I got in terms of filling out those buttons, the, I guess it makes sense, the less scholarships that were available. Absolutely. Okay? You think about it like a really, really big funnel of like 145 pages of scholarships. And the more filters you add to it, the thinner and thinner and thinner it gets until you get down to where you're at. And sometimes you truly can eliminate everything altogether. Well, now that brings up another question mm -hmm. because um, does it make sense when, like I live in New Jersey, mm -hmm. um, does it make sense to put in residency in New Jersey? Aren't I like taking myself out of the, the running for anything? I mean, why would I fill in? what state I live in. Uh, that's because that's where you're looking specifically for scholarships that are um, for residency of New Jersey. So that's a personal call as to whether or not you would want to do that or not. Okay. Um, but then, I, I like looking at them from a broad sense and really looking at it from the individual dates that are associated with them. Okay. I really do think that that does the best job as far as making it available. Okay. So for example, here's another question related to scholarship. Um, mm -hmm area of study i put in like computer science mm -hmm. i forget what it, it it seemed like it was the only selection for community computer science and i was getting like scholarships for journalism hmm. now that i can't answer i don't know why it would suddenly stick those in there as well because it should filter out that and only show you something that's specifically to like computers um yeah, and maybe, you know, again, so it, it sounds like when you're doing these scholarship searches, like in the case of the residency, it might be good to leave that kind of blank, right. but then the area of study is where you kind of funnel down, if you will. Yes. Yeah, so. I, I would agree with you that that's a good way to do it. You know, the other thing is, don't forget, it's also got the annual renewable scholarships. Uh -huh. um, there's also those that are specifically targeted towards financial aid. Um, you know, if you if you've got a significant financial aid need, that kind of stuff, and so you you can use those kinds of filters to really hone in on what um, are the types of things that make the most sense for your family. Okay, and so that financial need base, it's where you have your after you put in information. If you have a great need, that's when you would want to check that. Correct. Yes, absolutely, because those are the types of scholarships then that'll pop up and there is here's the thing that's interesting you know whenever you're dealing with these private scholarships that are out there um, you're going to see that there are plenty of them that have a need-based component to them meaning your family does indeed need to have a financial need to be able to even qualify or your student does so um, that's why if you if you hit that button that's what it's going to show as those types of options um, again if, i when i when i left that blank um it showed everything it yes it showed, does yeah. yeah okay so if you hit if you click financial need base are you going to get only need based scholarships that's what it's supposed to do yes okay yeah in other words those are going to have some kind of a financial need associated with them and and renewable means that you don't have to reapply is that correct? Well, that's correct. Well, there's going to be other than other than showing good grades or you whatever. You got it. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. The, a lot of times those come with extra perks or extra expectations of whether it's grades or being a full-time student or carrying a full-time load or whatever it might be. That those are the kinds of things that you often find with that. Okay. One final question before I'm like jeopardizing here uh, the the conversation, but are our scholarships kind of thin right now because we kind of just ended the previous year because again i kind of felt like they were a little thin in terms well of there's no doubt that when you look at the scholarship calendar the biggest months for private scholarships are february march and april in terms but, of when they're due 
um, well, when they're due and also when they're handed out, those okay. are the big months. And so, you know, there's, you will definitely see an uptick when we get to like November, December, but in particular, when we come, uh, uh, you know, into the next year, February, March, and April. Okay. So um, I, I, you know, I'm of the opinion, you ought to be looking for scholarships anytime you can. Okay. Um, because there's all kinds of different options that are out there. So. All right. Awesome. Thanks for your questions. Let me, uh, let me see who else we have here. Um, Karina, welcome. Did you have some questions this evening? Okay, let me also uh, open up Spencer here. Hey, Spencer, did you have any questions for us this evening or for me this evening? Okay, well then let me do this. I see there's a, a question in the Q and A. Um, thank you for putting that in there, Kate. I appreciate that. Um, for those of you that are wondering what this is, it's just um, the login details. So let me go back in here again. Um, folks, feel free to unmute yourself if you um, have any additional questions. You should be able to do that now because I've got everybody live. At least I think I do. And if for some reason I didn't uh, didn't do that, feel free to maybe put your hand up, raise your hand for me, and I'll be happy to open it up for you. But um, I'm glad to hear that you all have the software. Um, just so that you know a little bit of, about my background, um, I've been an independent educational consultant for 16 years, and I got introduced to the uh, College Aid Pro, which is um, the advisor side or the advisor platform uh, about three years ago and absolutely fell in love with it. You know, for me, it is uh, a software that's like the Swiss army knife of college funding. And, you know, the reason for that is because it allows you to really dive into your own personal situation in such a great way when it comes to looking at, um, both your finances as to how you're going to pay for college, then identifying schools that are going to be an affordability threshold for you and your family, um, helping to guide your students so that they can clearly see the numbers. Because, I mean, look, let's face it, when you're looking at the colleges, they often don't have any idea of how much a school is. They're just hearing their friends and maybe even family members sometimes talking about how great this school would be for them, and yet they have no idea how the schools look at your situation, you know, based on what your expected family contribution is going to be in particular, you know, whether it's a federal school, a consensus or an institutional um, platform that they're using, and then dealing with, you know, just the overall effects of, okay, now that we understand what the colleges think we can pay, do we qualify for any additional merit scholarships? And for me, that's one of the best things about the, the policy or, or excuse me, about the program is the fact that you've got the ability to actually look at the schools to get a sense of where your student might be eligible. Now, as we probably, I mean, as you, as you probably know, um, you know, when we're dealing with scholarships, it's a situation sometimes where I, there's a scholarship that could be guaranteed to a student. But in other cases, literally it's an eligibility range that a student could be going into. So that's why sometimes you'll see that there's a range of even the dollar amount that a student might receive. And so it's very much your understanding and your students' understanding of where they are as far as what their chances might be. So anyway, other questions? Um, let's see. Uh, I'm gonna you know, put you guys in a position where you're in the driver's seat as far as anything else that you might wanna do here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Joseph, looks like you've got a question. Uh, yes, yes I do. Uh, just uh, real quick, uh, by way of background, uh, my daughter, the older one, is going to be a sophomore next year at St. Joseph's near Philly, yeah. and I've been using your product uh, since going back, of course, before uh, you know she applied. She was probably a junior in high school, so I like where your product is going, the upgrades and the big change from where I started to what, because now I, there's basically two sort of versions, if you will, right? And the, yes. The newer one is very, very uh, slick. It's uh, very polished. It looks great. I'm glad you like it. Yeah, we, we've been really, really happy with it. And adding all kind of those extra perks to it is a big deal to give total transparency. 
No, and uh, for transparency purposes, um, let's see. So I told you the older one, she did go and apply to Villanova. And uh, the short of that process is that, of course, Villanova is FAFSA and CSS. Mm -hmm. uh, I did them both. And then I got an email explaining that I had some disconnect between the two things that I had filed with them. Uh, but Villanova, rather than explaining what their question was, gave me a pile of more paper oh, to no. fill out. <clears throat> uh, of course, uh, you know, we're in a good place here with my family and considering uh, you know, FAFSA, CSS, that's really for more need. Uh, we were going to qualify for that. So I just shelved it. And thankfully, she didn't end up going there anyway. Oh, OK. So a better opportunity came along, huh? Absolutely. No, uh, St. Joseph's uh, is a great school. It's, you know, we're, we're happy with their program. They're Jesuit. We like their their format, their liberal arts uh, approach to things. Uh, but I, if I can't ask you, if you can jot down, I, I want to sit down with someone so that now for daughter number two, and she's looking at schools, and I really, I said a little prayer on this one that she wouldn't need the CSS profile, but of course, she is looking at some schools uh, that do require it, like I think uh, Northeastern mm -hmm. is one. And uh, the folks listening, I don't want to mislead them. The CS, this, you know, it's all mainly a need-based focus, but Northeastern made it clear in one of their webinars uh, that even if you're coming in as a merit person, if you want to maximize your exposure to all the merit opportunities, you're required to fill out the FAFSA and CSS, regardless of the fact that you would not get any need-based money. It didn't matter. If you want to have your best shot at merit, you need to fill out this horrible thing uh, to be in the running. So uh, I think you probably have all my information there. So if you could, I need to, I would like to make an appointment with someone. Yeah, and, and we'll, we'll definitely reach out to you, uh, yeah. Joseph. And by the way, thank you for bringing that up. You know, it's it's one of those hidden little nasty secrets that's out there is that there are indeed a couple of handfuls of colleges that um, they, they kind of push you. In fact, a lot of the colleges do this anyway. Um, you know, have you submitted all your financial aid forms? And, you know, um, on top of that, uh, another school that comes to, mount, to mind is Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech mm -hmm. often says that, hey, we expect to see things. In fact, they've got their own financial aid um, <laughs> institutional form that you've got to complete. <laughs> and the whole thing is it's almost like they're doing a preliminary check. But the reality is, too, is that um, for some of their specific um, institutional aid, that's the only way that you can get access to it. So, right. yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. And you really have to do the research on it. Unfortunately, there's not a list out there that just says, you know, here are the 15 or 20 schools across the country that do this. It's um, it's kind of on a case by case basis. Yeah, it was a it was a bit of an eye opener in the case of Villanova. And when I told them, you know, what, forget it. I, I'm not coming in for any need. I'm not going to qualify regardless. Uh, yeah, they they just shrugged. They're Villanova. There's a thousand people behind me. And there really wasn't a lot of care about what I was thinking or how I felt or, hey, you know, why don't you just tell me where the error is, but instead you want more paper. And I, you know, so thankfully St. Joe's came in, a uh, strong merit school. You know, we have a strong merit candidate with both daughters. So, and again, to your, uh, your process, your program, you know, we could look for the schools that were favoring merit versus schools that favored need. So we could you know, put ourselves in the lane to get positioned to hopefully get a nice payout. And in full disclosure, uh, we $29,000 in merit. Wow, that's fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah no, no complaints. <laughs> you know, so um, yeah, I think that was all I wanted to, to convey. Just uh, if your student is looking at a school and they require the CSS profile, Take a, a deep breath. I mean, you already know this. If I you're do, yeah. if you're FAFSA, they want the you know the custodial parent and their data, and it pretty much stops there. The CSS profile. If you're divorced, they want you and your new spouse plus your old spouse. And if that's divorced spouse, Mary, they want that person's stuff it's too. Four people that you got to get all the details from. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it can really be amazing. 
as I say, the CSS profile in particular is one of the most intrusive documents. Mm -hmm. And it also depends on the school because, mm -hmm. I mean, there are even schools out there that ask for the make, model, and value <laughs> that you place on your cars, um, which is sure. incredible that they would even ask that kind of stuff, but they sure do. Yeah, yeah, they, 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 there's, there's no bounds on the, on yeah. the CSS level. Who that information? Yeah. When, is it, okay. How long uh, is I'm, it kept? The information from CSS profile, how long the schools keep it? Oh, uh, well. Um, and go on to it because it's kind of like all your whole life. You know? <laughs> it mm. is, unfortunately, you're, you're very right on that. Um, so, I, you know what? I've never, I, I don't know the answer to that as far as how long they're allowed to retain that information. But I have to believe that from year, well, first of all, we know that from year to year, you have to reapply for the financial aid. And so I have to assume that from year to year, they also purge their system of the old and bring in the new. So that would be my, my gut reaction to it. But yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, and by the way, let's also not forget that with the CSS profile in particular, there are some schools, and I'll, I'll throw one out there, which is Princeton, who they require both the FAVSA, uh, FAVSA and the CSS profile the first year, but then the second year, you don't have to do the CSS profile. You just have to do the uh, FAFSA to um, provide them what they need. And again, that's a that's a school by school basis that you just have to to um, you know to make sure that you know about. Yeah. So I, again, if you just you know put my name and number, and I'll wait for someone to call. I did it myself last time, and then I just can't imagine just doing it again. I have I don't want to have to figure it all out by myself one more time. Okay. Well, Joseph, I've got you down for sure. We will definitely reach out to help you with those documents. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much for, uh, for sharing that with us tonight. Appreciate it. Okay, folks, anybody else have a, a question? Actually, let me go in here. I see that we've got somebody else that joined us. Hello, Kat. Um, didn't know if you had any questions that you wanted to bring up this evening. I'm happy to try to answer them for you here. And by the way, if I don't have an answer, I promise you I will make a connection and um, get you what you need to know. But um, uh, let's see. Feel free to unmute yourself if you would like. Um, and by doing that, you've got uh, the ability to go ahead and ask uh, other questions. I, I guess while we're waiting on that, just a reminder, because I had an interesting conversation with a, another CAP family today. Um, they are real excited about, you know, getting going on their financial aid forms. And I said to them, you know, the most important thing that you need to do right now is go ahead and get on there for the, um, uh, or to set up your FSA ID, for example, for one for the student, and then one for one parent only is the way that that works. And in the case of a divorce family, of course, what we're talking about is it's going to be the custodial parent under the current regulations. Now, you guys are probably aware that there's some big changes coming in the future. Maybe you don't, but um, it's going to be interesting to see how they handle it, in particular when it comes to a divorce situation down the road, uh, because the current legislation change states that it's going to be the parent who provides the, the most financial benefit to the child, which, quite frankly, it should be. Um, but it, you know, right now it's based on whichever parent the student lives with at least 51% of the time. So um, I share that with you because with the changes that are coming there, um, it's not only with that, but other things that are coming into play. But back to the story with this family. So apparently their daughter was so excited that not only had she gotten her FSA ID set up, but she had already started to work on her FAVSA. Well, the problem with that is that if she starts on it now, she's really applying for the spring of her senior year in school. And so we sure don't want that because she's of course not applying until the fall of the following year. Um, so just be cautious about that. You have to wait until after October the 1st of the senior year to start working on both the FAVSA and the CSS profile um, so that you're actually doing it based on the, the current um, school year, you know, the school year that you're applying for. So very important that you know that. Uh, any other questions from anybody? T uh, Tamara, go ahead. Um, on the note of the um, the FAFSA ID, mm -hmm. um, we I created one 
we created one for my son because I think that's the order in which you create them. Mm. And I have uh, an email that states that all of his, you know, social security information has been um, verified. verified. Yeah. Now, um, you said that, does that mean that mine is created or now do I no. need to create mine? Yeah, now you need to create your own as well. And, and by the way, you can do that at any time. You can do the students or the parents. The key though is just to go ahead and do, the, do yours now. And what you're gonna discover with it is you have to be very careful to make sure that you retain, of course, your username and your password. And the other part about that is um, they're gonna ask you four or five security questions to protect it. And, and by the way, the reason this happened, just so that you know, is that back um, before the, the, the last election, not the most recent one, but the one before, believe it or not, somebody tried to get into the financial aid system and try to get Donald Trump's tax return information. And so it threw up a red flag and they had to do whatever they could then to protect everybody because they discovered that there were people out there trying to get this kind of information on folks. So Again, set up an FSA ID for your child and then an FSA ID for one parent and one parent only. And then that's what you're going to use to electronically both get into. So from the student side, you use it to get into the, the FAVSA and then to electronically sign it at the end, both the student and the parent are gonna use those, those FSA IDs to do that. Now, what I found and again, I mean, we've only done it for my son. And by the way, my, my son is a rising senior. Oh, okay. So, um, I've been told that uh, for any other rising seniors that you should create that ID sooner versus later because if everybody does it around October 1st, this, I've heard that the system is a little overloaded. There's no doubt it is. And in fact, there are families who, who try to hop on to do their uh, FAVSA at uh, 12.01, you know, into the, to October 1st, the new year. And um, here's what I will say to you, every single college out there has a deadline uh, when they expect to see that kind of information. But in addition to that, you will find that there are some times where, um, you know, where you may not be able to um, get into the system initially because it's backlogged so bad. And in fact, the system has even crashed before because there's so many people on um, the FAS, uh, FASO website working on it. So, but you traditionally have some time. It's, it's not like you're going to be out of luck if you miss the first week or even the second week. Um, the only other exception to that is that there are some cases where somebody might want to go ahead and get it in as soon as possible because they're trying to qualify for some specific uh, financial aid that's specific to their state. So for example, the state of Kentucky um, has some financial aid that it's a, it's a um, situation where you have to apply for it and get to it and it does run out. And so there are some other situations where that could be the case as well. Okay. So. So, um, and then and just another question, do you actually get a number or no, uh, like, do you get a number assigned to you, you or you, you don't just have actually, access? Well, no, because you set up a username, which could be just your email and mm -hmm. then your password that you create. Those are the two things that you're going to use to be able to get in there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see here. Spencer, I am trying to figure out um, why you can't talk. Uh, that's really kind of weird for me. Here we go. Let's try this now. Can you hear me now, Spencer? Or can you un un unmute yourself? Let's see here. Not sure why that's not letting you do that. Hmm. Well, I'll tell you what, um, Maureen, let me open you up here. Do you have any questions uh, for me tonight? Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and turn everybody on. If anyone has any questions, feel free to go ahead and ask them. Um, right now, everybody is in an unmute mode, but um, I'm not sure, Spencer, why you're not 
able to get through. Um, worst case, if you want to, you could put in your question into the Q&A and I'll be happy to answer it for you. Dan, uh, can you talk a little bit about the institutional EFC and consensus EFC? Sure, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, one of the biggest differences whenever you're dealing with those documents, and it was already mentioned, that with the institutional and the consensus, which are all tied to completing the CSS profile, by the way, that um, they handle things differently. So, for example, many of the institutional colleges will indeed take home equity into consideration. Now, how they do that could be different. It could be that a school has a specific formula that says that they'll only use, for example, one to one and a half times your earnings um, as what that, that maximum number might be. Um, they could use the full value though. It could be that they're gonna take the full 6% of that value as an asset that could be used to pay for college. And just so that you know, recently I had a conversation with another um, family where, and, and maybe some of you actually live in this whole, the same situation. They have significant equity in the apartment that they own or the apartments that they own in Boston. But um, in that particular case, the program absolutely is saying this is what the schools are going to use against you, which is, you know, whatever that value is, 6% of that could potentially come into play. So it can really throw you as a family when you see how much they're using from a uh, equity position. Now, the thing that's important is that your home equity is not taken into consideration, whether it's the uh, FAVSA or the CSS profile. It's strictly those other properties which could be considered, for example, um, investment real estate. Um, there is an exception also when it comes to that value when it comes to the uh, FAVSA in the sense that if it's owned in an LLC or or a, a business arrangement, that it could also be protected. However, moving forward, um, and that's another big difference, um, the FAVSA only looks at uh, a situation with a business if you have over 100 employees. In other words, if it's a family-owned business, that value doesn't even show up. But in the future, again, with the new legislation that's been passed, it's very possible that what's going to happen is the value of any size business, whether it's family-owned or not, is going to have to be put into those financial aid forms. Um, in addition to that, the, one of the other uh, uh, unique situations currently is, let's say that you own a business and that you actually take a loss on that business. And so maybe you've taken a, a write-off of $350,000. And so your adjusted gross income on your tax return is a negative $350,000. Well, right now, that family, if it's a, a FAVSA only school, could qualify for need-based aid, which would mean that you'd qualify for the Pell Grant, a, probably a subsidized loan where the interest is covered and those types of things. The exception would be if you apply to a school that's a institutional or consensus, because in those cases, what they're going to do is they're going to add in those losses because those are often business losses back into the equation. And so as you can imagine, that significantly impacts your expected family contribution. So that's the one exception as far as, you know, right now what's going on with that. Um, I'm trying to think if there's other, I mean, obviously the biggest thing that happens with the CSS profile schools with, with very few exceptions, and, and Joseph mentioned this, is the fact that you could potentially have four parents' income and assets that have to go into it if you're divorced. Um, the one exception would be that if a school asks or does not ask for the non-custodial parent, one example of that is UNC Chapel Hill um, does not. So they don't ask you to put in the non-custodial parent. The biggest challenge there, of course, is if you don't live in North Carolina, it's your ability to be able to get it, your student admitted to that school because it's so daggone uh, competitive as an out-of-state student since only 17% of their incoming freshmen um, can be from out-of-state. So um, those are probably the biggest highlights I would put out there. Um, other than the CSS profile has a lot more intrusive questions about your finances. There are also some questions in there that quite frankly, you really don't have to answer. If it doesn't have an asterisk next to it, then you don't have to answer it. And yet families do it all the time. And I, you know, we're of the opinion, 
only give them what they, they ask for. Don't give them any more because by you giving them more information, you're actually hurting your, your, your situation there a little bit, okay? Um, I hope that helps. Um, let me see here. So here's a question from Spencer. Again, Spencer, I'm, I'm not sure why you you can't do it, but it says, uh, oh, it's the meat on your machine. Okay, now I understand. Um, yeah, I don't know. Actually, in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, you ought to be able to unmute yourself, uh, but maybe not. Um, you say here, do you have to put the non-custodial expenses or ex-spouse on the CSS profile? I, interestingly, that's what I was just talking about. So it depends on the school. And it absolutely is a situation where um, the college is going to determine who's the custodial parent and who the non-custodial parent is. Now, look, let me tell you, I, I deal with these situations in divorce cases all the time. Um, I've actually you know, gotten to the point where I'm pretty good at being that mediator in between. You know, If mom and dad have a really bad relationship and they're not talking to each other, and as you say, they're not cooperating, then you know one of the things that you can indeed do is what you're asking about is can you get a waiver? That's uh, that's a um, per school basis that you would have to have that conversation. Um, the other thing is that sometimes you know maybe there's a way to go ahead and work around that because let's not forget something that's important about the CSS profile. You see what they do is that you're setting up so it, the student and the custodial parent complete one side of the CSS profile. And then the non-custodial parent, what they do is that they're responsible then for um, actually setting up their own CSS profile account, believe it or not. They go in, they set it up as though they're a student, um, and then that gives them the ability to complete the non-custodial side of the CSS profile. There's only one person that has the ability to see both sides of that coin, and that's the student. And so if both parents trust that student, that they're not going to share that information, then, you know, there's really no reason that they shouldn't be able to get that completed. So um, that would be my advice. In worst case scenario, you know, you could work with us at CAP. Um, again, we work with, um, you know, divorce situations where we can be that person in between to make sure the documentation gets done. Because I will tell you, this actually happened a few years ago, but there was a family where the mom absolutely refused to complete the documentation. And even though the young lady had been accepted to U Chicago, she was rejected and kicked uh, kicked off the platform because they couldn't get the financial aid form processed. So I hope that doesn't happen to any of you. But that's you know, unfortunately, with some schools, there is not a waiver. They expect to see both sides of the coin. Uh, Lisa, did you have a question for me? No? Okay. Uh, let me let Wen in here. Hello, Wen. I didn't know if you had any questions or if anybody else does, feel free to go ahead and share your question with me. Yeah, um, yeah I don't Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, thank you. I see. Thank you very much. I mean, I kind of I kind of came in to see who is in charge tonight because I, I attended a pack, uh, the she, you know, like a like she hosted, I think last week or the week before last week. Uh -huh. She went on vacation because I'm also a financial planner. So I'm just using the professional version. I mean, also like, you know, the, I mean, I'm kind of a debating to, to go with it. I think now my decision pretty much like more like you follow the client to you. So like, I'm kind of a see of, you know, what kind of a people here accept the tag. The tag is a PET, right? Uh, you mean the CAP, C-A-P? Yeah. No, 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 no. The other lady, she... Holds... Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. You're talking about PEG, P-E-G. Yes. Yeah, yeah. She's on yeah. vacation. So I'm kind of saying, oh, because I know PEG, I talked to uh, Mike Brown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I talked to, hi, you know, Christine, or Christine, right? So she's uh -huh. a young lady. So I'm kind of because she mentioned about a couple, I think like you have 15 or 20 people in the company. I know Joe because Joe actually came to FPA. He promoted this software. You know, I do actually, I do a lot of uh, furniture because like my client has more like a middle class. So they're really into the financial, you know, like uh, financial aid, all of that, you know, like a stuff, stuff, CSS. So yeah, but I came late. I just want to see 
who's in charge of impact on vacation, or who's in charge. That's, that's basically my purpose. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, when I appreciate you being on here tonight. Yeah, so um, I actually um, have been working with CAP since, or well, uh, College Aid Pro and, and the MyCAP um, since about um, March and March and April timeframe. And the reason being is- This that, year? That's, pardon me? This year. This year, yeah. Oh, okay. But I've been an independent educational consultant using the CAP software for the past three years and have actually been in practice for 16. So um, I love it. I mean, I love the software. I think it's by far the best tool that's been created to help give transparency to families, especially when, I mean, look, let's face it, the price of college isn't going down. Mm -hmm. it's, it's continuing to get you know uh, more expensive every year. Mm -hmm. And this tool gives you at least the ability to get some transparency on what scholarship students might be able to receive, what their expected family contribution is. I mean, all those kinds of important details so that then you can put yourself in a position of power as far as I'm concerned when it comes to maybe going back and appealing offers that schools uh, provide. So, yes. uh, so I'm just real excited that. that you've got the software. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so basically I, I mean, I'm kind of asking some of the questions because I'm, consulting clients. So, mm -hmm. I mean, because like, I mean, I really, the real case is like, you know, the, the EFC because of two kids in the, fam in the family going to college. So actually the school gave them much lower than what, you know, the EFC, actually the EFC did use the numbers much higher than mm -hmm. whatever showed up on this, you know, cap, you know, uh, cap pro, right? the college cap, you know, college aid pro. Mm -hmm. So, so, I mean, do you have, you know, in your past experience, do you actually quote, you know, I mean, I got this number from my college aid pro. I mean, use this one as a reference to kind of appeal to the school. Have you ever used that? Absolutely, I have. Yeah, I, I think it's important that you, you know, that you do that. The, the, truly the best way to appeal, however, on any school is to make sure that you've got a comparable school that they've also applied to, you know. I'm sorry, what's that? So one of the best ways to be able to appeal to another college for additional money yeah. is to be in a situation where you have um, another school that this, the family or the student has also applied to that maybe gave them more uh, scholarship or, you know, need-based aid. In mm -hmm. other words, use that as a leveraging tool for one school to the next. Um, the other way is for sure to be in a case where, um, you know, they're not going to take the word of the CAP software or the College Aid Pro software. What they are going to do is that they're going to take, you know, an understanding that you've been doing your homework or that your families have been doing their homework when it comes to options yeah. that are available, um, you know, and or circumstances that they did not know about, that the college did not know about that then need to be disclosed to that individual or yeah, to that yeah, individual yeah. school. I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah, I do have a real situation. So actually this, this you know, the, as I mentioned, the two, two kids, right? So the one I actually really have a problem with, she is in uh, PATH, PATH school, you know, PATH University in, in Boston. Okay. So, I mean, she's a second year, but she has a sister, I mean, applying for uh, just a regular FAFSA school. So the FAFSA school, obviously the schools are like very low with, with need fulfilling, like only like 50%. I look at your profile on the Country Aid Pro. So, but for her, you know, because her, her EFC for FAFSA, because the family have businesses, okay? So mm -hmm. the family has, the, you know, that's another question I want to ask. So the family has, you know, the one has a corporation, C corporation for their, you know, restaurant or business. Other one, I mean, the father have a rental property, okay? So for the rental property is also under RLC, you know, limited liability company. So that's why we put the, the you know, the, the real estate under the whole investment. So the, they have the investment, like the investment profile that's real estate, the whole asset, you know? So because of the, the, the rental property already paid off. And so, so this kind of case, but even for the EFC, because the two kids are in school, her EFC, I mean, under under I institutional methodology, she's like 21,000 for the task one. But the school using 
36 points, you know, like, like way higher because the school I believe is using last year, you know, when she was really into school on her own because she was the only kid into school. And then the second year, because they have two kids in the school, I think now we still have this, you know, discount, right? Mm -hmm. So do you know when the next, when this, what I call the FAFSA, what I call the simplification, are they going to implement next year or, you know? Yeah, so. Yeah. so when that's a good question because that's really something that families need to be cautious about is that yeah. that new um that whole thing is supposed to go into effect with the October 2023 uh FAVSA which is for the 2024-2025 school okay. year. I see. Yeah. yeah. So so they're still fine for this year but the school just insists on using number not from FAFSA not barrels like 11 11,000 for them. For the institutional, you know, for CSS, for, for, for TAP, it's 21. But the school using a form of all your student, all you know, your EFC is 36,000. So we're kind of appealing, but it's like we just appealed. Mm -hmm. But I think it's a very tough battle because the school said, oh, you know, I mean, I don't even know where their that EFC come, you know, came from. They have a 36,000 mm -hmm. because based on the federal, based on institution, because institutional, Except on College Aid Pro, you know, or CAC, you you have that, you know, number. But for CSS, when you submit the CSS, there's no number. They won't have a EFC on the institutional. No, they you're absolutely it. right. It, it's the mystery number that's uh -huh. behind the scenes, which is why, at least with the um, the CAP software, you get some sense of what it might be. Um, yeah. You know, and and they're very in. in uh, intentional about that. They they don't want you to know their formula and exactly yeah. how they do all that kind of stuff. Yes, you know? but the thing is, because the thing is, the, the, the point here is like the federal EFC last year was like 30, 32,000. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but so by the FAFSA EFC for this year, because they consider the two case, the discount, it's only like 11,000. Mm -hmm. But the school insists that, oh, you know, we assume your EFC is 36,000. I mean, do we have a, do we have a ground we can stand to go up here? If they're using the CSS profile, they're setting the rules as to how they hand out their institutional money. Yes. That's the challenge. You know, so, um, you know, the, the problem that exists is it's the difference between what the federal might say and what the CSS profile, specifically the institutional or consensus might say. Um, but for a college that uses the CSS profile, it's their choice as to which number they want to go with. Yes, but the thing is that for last year, last year they used, because last year was, you know, you know the FAFSA, mm -hmm. you know, the FAFSA have a year, right? FAFSA, yes, it was 30,000. 30, 30, 30, they use that number mm -hmm. to give them the aid, okay? But this year they have a much lower number, but it, but have, instead of using you know, the, the real EFC number for this year, they used last year and then they, that, they increase like maybe 20%. Now this year's you know, the EFC is all oh, 36 of it. Well, so here's the sad truth, and I hope this is not the case. But you know what? Sometimes colleges front end their their financial aid offer the first year to kind of get you. Okay. Uh, you know, in other words, that the student is there, so the next year they don't offer the same amount of a financial aid package that they did the first year. Okay. I'm telling you, it happens. Um, I won't mention a specific school, but I had a situation a, a couple of years back now where I had a student who the first year got a significant amount of financial aid. In the second year, even though he did exactly what they told him to do, he came back and they said, oh, I'm sorry, but your financial aid offer is down by $20,000 this year. And thankfully, he was in a position where his mom and dad were able to figure out a way to come up with that money. But it does happen. You know, our gapping, funding gapping does indeed happen at some schools. And so, you know, the unfortunate part is that it's an annual renewable process Yes. And there's only one person in control of that, which is the schools. I see. Okay, because the schools are, oh, we made a mistake for the first year, we give you too much. Mm, well, you know? yeah, yeah it, <laughs> they can say whatever they want to, but the reality is, you know, and that's why I, I would still appeal and say, hey, look, you guys did this last year, what's the deal? But yeah. they're in the driver's seat as far as what could happen with that. 
So yes, the, the, what we did, but just I'm just asking for the chances, you know, because it's just so ridiculous. In the last right. year, number is like three times more, but you know, but really appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, good luck on that. Yeah, I mean, she Sherry did. So I mean, I really good luck to her. You know, but I, I really use the software. Oh, I good. came up with a number, so I think yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Good. So thanks, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for using the CAP software. Actually, thank you everybody for using the CAP software, the the MyCap or the the full um, advisor side of it. Um, we're just about there at eight o'clock for tonight. Does anybody have another question before we wrap up? I'd be happy to try to answer it real quick here. I have a very quick question, and I, you already talked about it, but I just want to make sure. Um, so even though FAFSA opens on October 1st, um, I can now uh, create my ID. Yes, and you my absolutely can. ID. Yep. Go ahead and create that student ID and create that parent ID right now. There's no reason that you can't. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, folks. Well, it's that magic eight o'clock hour. I want to thank you all so much for being here tonight. For those of you that I said I would get back in touch with, I promise you I will. And uh, I just want to thank you for being on this open Q&A session this evening. As you know, we try to do this, um, you know, as often as we can to try to help you out. But um, hope this has been helpful. And uh, again, thanks for using the uh, College Aid Pro or the MyCap software. And um, best of luck to you as you continue to move forward with your college plans. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Uh, Thank good you. night.